Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the first lectures I ever gave uh, as a as a photographer uh, was at the West Jersey chapter, and I think that was in like 2011. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, it's nice to be back. And a little bit about me. Uh, I, I always assume that you know when I'm invited back to things, people know who I am, but I don't. I don't like to assume anything. Um, so just as a, as a background, I, I grew up here in Southern New Jersey. Uh, I lived in Somerdale for half of my life and the other half I was in Gloucester Township. Um, and, uh, my interest has always been, um, that of the, the landscape, uh, and how we sort of understand it and interact with it and, and sort of preserve its histories and carry on uh, its this information through generations. Um, so I've worked a lot uh, in this in this realm um, and in both architectural spaces um, and and the built environment as well as the natural landscape. Um, you know I, I use my camera as a way to sort of interpret place, uh, its beauty, its use and 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 how we interface with it as people. Uh, in 2006, uh, I began uh, a project that became known as From the Main Line. Uh, after a series of projects in Philadelphia and in the surrounding areas, uh, I, I wanted to get take on a project that was sustainable long term. Um, and I wanted to incorporate, you know, the landscape, architecture, history, engineering. Uh, so what better place to start? With, with the Pennsylvania Railroad, especially if you want something, the, a project that's going to last forever because there's so much material. Uh, the project was really never about the trains themselves, but more so about the engineering and the infrastructure and the significant impact that the Pennsylvania Railroad had in shaping the American landscape. Uh, as a result of this work, I've been fortunate enough to find commercial climate, uh, clients and assignment work that do just this, you know, that examine both historical sites and contemporary engineering projects while being trusted to handle these subjects in the same way that I do with my own work. <clears throat> A lot of this work is inspired by the work of William Rao uh, and his peers uh, from the mid to late 19th century. Some of these photographers are probably some of the most influential uh, both as image makers and uh, as informational pieces uh, to my work. Uh, much of my work relies on the dialogue of, of looking at historical imagery, its history, and trying to understand what survives by looking backwards um, to understand the corridor, in particular with the Pennsylvania Railroad and the place, places that it traveled through and that have evolved around that landscape. Uh, the Blue Juniata is uh, a, a sort of new exploration. So, you know, the, the, the middle division of the Pennsylvania Railroad is probably one of my favorite pieces of the railroad, both for the beautiful landscape and the river, uh, the railroad itself, and the, the towns and just the sort of historical information that's so embedded in that landscape. Uh, the Juniata River. Uh, the name who's who's thought to derive from the Oroquian word, sorry, I gotta, my notes are cut off here. Uh, Oniata, meaning standing stone, is roughly 104 miles long and encompassing 3,400 square miles of watershed. The valley is said to be the home of roughly four tribes of Native Americans collectively associated with the Lenni Lenape Indians. Uh, Non-native traders began navigating the banks of this river as early as the first and second quarters of the 17th century. And by 1741, Irish-Scottish settlers began to call the Juniata Valley home. By the 1750s, we start to see names familiar with today's Juniata Valley, marking towns and settlements along the river. <clears throat> By the early 1800s, the race to push westward began and with the construction of the Erie Canal commencing in 1817. 
1827, the charter was granted for the construction of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And in 1828, the CNO Canal commenced construction generally on the same course. Philadelphia and the Commonwealth realized that they needed to secure a Western route for trade from Philadelphia. And this came by the way of the main line of public works, which is a state owned network of canals, railroads and inclined planes that commenced construction in 1826 and was completed by 1834. This included the Philadelphia and Columbia Railway, the Juniata Division Canal, the Allegheny Portage Railroad, and the Western Division Canal. Despite the modern engineering of the mainline public works, the Erie Canal had a significant advantage. 83 locks and 363 miles with an elevation change of 654 feet. In contrast, the Juniata and Western divisions faced an elevation change of 1,168 feet, utilizing 167 locks over 276 miles, plus 10 inclined planes, making it a very expensive and laborious venture. In 1839, the Commonwealth commissioned Charles Schlatter to survey a potential route for continuous rail across the Commonwealth. Presented in Senate in 1841, the Schlatter survey offered three routes, the Northern, Middle, and Southern routes. From his reconnaissance, the Middle route was recommended as the most ideal path for the construction of the railroad. I gotta make sure this works because it's supposed to be a video function. Yeah, there we go. So uh, the Middle route followed the Susquehanna North from Harrisburg, diverging at the Juniata River, following it West. The proposed route follows the Juniata Valley to Lewistown, diverging along the Kiskoqualis Creek a short distance and turning west to follow the valley north of the mountain bearing the same name. Schlatter's route then returns to the Juniata Valley at Mill Creek, moving west through Huntington to Petersburg. And at Petersburg, the route roughly follows the Little Juniata to Bald Eagle Creek uh, and Davisburg, which was a proximity to Tyrone taking a path following the Little Juniata River to Burgoon Run and the climb for the summit of the Allegheny Mountains. <clears throat> While the Schlatter survey never materialized for the main line of public works, the Pennsylvania Railroad was chartered in 1846 by the PA legislator to create a private railroad across the Commonwealth, or Pennsylvania Railroad. The caveat of the Pennsylvania Railroad's charter was if they could secure funding and construct a percentage of line by a prescribed date, the PRR would be granted the charter to Pittsburgh, sorting dominance there by pushing out Baltimore and Ohio. If the PRR failed, the BNO would win their case, secure the route to Baltimore, leaving the Commonwealth at a major disadvantage. The task of building the new railroad was given the chief engineer, J. Edgar Thompson, uh, Thompson basically adapted Schlatter's uh, middle route via the Susquehanna and the Juniata west of the Allegheny Range. The most significant deviations was from the middle route was the choice to follow the Juniata westward between Lewistown and Mill Creek and to stay southeast of the Little Juniata River in Blair County from Tyrone to Altoona. By December of 1849, the railroad reached McVeightown, 72 miles from Harrisburg. And by April the following year, it reached Schaefer's Aqueduct near Mount Union. And June in Huntington, same year. And late September of and late in the September of 1850, the PRR made construction with the or, I'm sorry, connection with the Portage Railroad in Hollidaysburg, a total distance of 137 miles from Harrisburg. <clears throat> By the middle of February, 1854, the mountain division was completed, giving the Pennsylvania Railroad a dedicated route over the Alleghenies, completing the difficult route from Petersburg via the Little Juniata to Tyrone, Altoona, and over the Alleghenies via Horseshoe Curve, thus completing its own line from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh. In the next 50 years, the Pennsylvania Railroad would grow from a trans-commonwealth operation to ultimately become one of the largest rail systems in the United States. 
Double tracking of the line began late in the 1850s, and the massive system improvements of Chief Engineer William H. Brown began in the eight, early 1880s and ran through the early 1900s, forever changing, changing the landscape of both the railroad and its neighboring environs. Throughout this explosive period of growth and lasting well into the 20th century, the Pennsylvania Railroad turned to another product of the modern age to chronicle its achievements. Photography grew to prominence alongside the rise of the railroad. It became the new way of disseminating the world and the Pennsylvania Railroad's photographic commissions produced photo mechanical illustrations, stereo cards, mammoth plates and etchings that would live in hotels abroad, be reproduced in travel guides and keepsakes and printed in literature for the railroad ranging from annual reports to passenger marketing pieces. William Perviance, born in 1829, was designated the first Pennsylvania Railroad official photographer in 1867. Perviance re uh, retained a studio in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and published views under the name Perviance's Views of the Pennsylvania Central Railroad and Scenery of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Frederick Gutekunst, born in 1831, was commissioned in 1875 to produce photographs of the railroad in time for the 1876 Centennial Exposition. The New York Herald quipped that Gutenkunst's work played a prominent role presenting large landscape views along the Pennsylvania Railroad at the fair. And uh, Gutekunst really, he, he kind of made his, his prominence um, known in photography as in, in the American Civil War, recording portraits of soldiers and generals and other prominent, prominent Union uh, Army officials, as well as the landscape during the war. Um, you can see a, a great photograph of Gutekunst's uh, studio here, uh, which unfortunately I did not record the location. I believe this one was on Arch Street, but I'm, I, I could be wrong about that. Finally, William Rao. Uh, William Rao from 1887 to 1924 uh, was the official uh, photographer for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Based out of Philadelphia, Rao produced over 3,843 negatives for just the Pennsylvania Railroad alone. His best known work uh, was commissioned to hang in the PRR's pavilion at the Columbian Exposition in 1893. And it was produced over two campaigns, one in 1891, and another in 1893, just prior to the exposition. A later portfolio work from 1905 recently surfaced in the last 10 or 15 years and details uh, key improvement projects during the Cassatt and Brown era improvements. <clears throat> so these commercial commissions were designed to drive home a message of a sophisticated, new, and modern way of transportation while paying homage to sort of academic schools of history and landscape painting, where the art understood the importance of historical sites and relics of the previous era. These photographs illustrate the transition of a landscape that was distinctly regionalized and becoming a much bigger part of the um, greater unified American landscape. The collection of work that you're about to view ranges from roughly 1867 to 1907 and reflects an incredible amount of change uh, on the railroad and in the landscape from the 19th to early 20th centuries. Traveling east to west, we start with the third and final iteration of the Rockville Bridge, having just been completed uh, prior to being photographed by William Rao. Uh, this particular image is a 68 inch by 17 inch uh, contact print uh, made with palladium uh, or platinum palladium process, which is a pretty uh, remarkable process. It's a very uh, stable um, photographic process. But to understand this, you know, this was a, a contact printing process. So you had to, the negative that you wanted or the print size that you wanted was the size of the negative that you shot. <clears throat> uh, at Duncannon, uh, we see the recently completed four-track main line in the vicinity of J.O. or later View Tower. Uh, in the distance, you can see the stacks of the Duncannon Ironworks uh, standing on the left. Uh, a little bit of historical research shows that at this point, 
the works was down to just nail production, which would cease the following year. In the distance on the right is the expanse of river valley that marks the confluence of the Juniata and Susquehanna rivers. Iron production in the Juniata Valley was prevalent for more than half a century. The Caroline Furnace operated until roughly the Civil War along the Juniata Division Canal. In a nod to the past and in the tradition of historical paintings, Rao depicts the derelict furnace in Baileysburg, Pennsylvania. In another nod to history, Rao opted to include the stranded canal boats in the foreground, making, this, uh, making them a central theme to the composition. Uh, Trimmer's Rock uh, was an area east of Newport, Pennsylvania. And at this point, the railroad had already begun its realignment to what we know it today. Uh, originally sparn, uh, spurred by the great floods of 1889. Uh, the canal bed in the foreground at this point was an isolated stretch only, running only between Newport and the immediate west. So while the perception is that the canals are still there and they're still active, these in reality are just stranded canal, uh, canal boats that are, that are left behind. In this 1875 view, uh, this shows the original main line through Newport alongside the Marshall Furnace. Today, uh, the turn of the century railroad, uh, or, or toward, I'm sorry, uh, toward the turn of the century, the railroad expanded to its four track system, relocating its main away from the center of town, and as a result, filling in the canal to the right and skirting the edge of town with the new right of way. PV Interlocking, whose call letters relate back to the town's previous name of Perrysville, marks the town of Port Royal, where the expansion of the four-track main line has reached its end at this time in 1891. Situated in a wide, fertile valley where the Tuscarora Creek empties into the Juniata, Port Royal was the terminal of the narrow-gauge Tuscarora Valley Railroad, which brought goods down the valley and interchanged them with the Pennsylvania Railroad. West of Mifflin, the Juniata threads through a narrow gap between log and shade mountains known as the Lewistown Narrows. Um, here, the canal and the railroad navigated the gap on opposing sides of the Juniata. At Hallstone, uh, deep in the Narrows, is the site of an early track tank arrangement where steam trains could take on water at speed. Uh-oh. Uh, we're going to skip this one because the image is not loading. Uh, we'll, we're going to use our imagination. We're looking at the Lewistown train station. Um, yeah, it's a snowstorm. <laughs> I have a feeling there might be two more snowstorms. We'll see. Um, yeah, well, it might be fog too. Uh, so in McVeigh Town, uh, located uh, west of Lewistown is in a valley of rich farmland that's framed by the Blue Mountains in the distance. Uh, interestingly enough, in this photograph, uh, the station no longer survives, but the boarding house, which is shrouded by a tree in the background on the right, uh, dates to 1850 and still stands today. Uh, in a beautiful scene by Rao in 1891, we see the long curve coming out of the east to the right, the frame, and the very still Juniata River. The fertile lowlands of the Juniata are very evident in this section of the river where the valley widens out. Uh, snowstorm. All right, so approaching Mount Union, uh, Goody Kunt's specially appointed train uh, stands in the foreground as he aims the large plate camera towards the Juniata Bridge and Schaefer's Aqueduct uh, crossing the Juniata. Visible in the distance um, is the narrow gap in Jack's Mountain that's carved by the Juniata River, Juniata River known as Jack's Narrows. Interestingly enough, this particular area, um, when they expanded the right of way and built uh, the new four track bridge that exists today, they built it in the path of uh, Schaefer's Aqueduct, which you can, if you if you visit that area, the stone piers that supported the original Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge are still there, and just in the shadow of the uh, the current bridge. I just discovered this this last year and 
was amazed that that was all still there. Also on the far side of the river, uh, there's some stone retaining walls that date back to the canal. Okay, so the Lewistown Narrows uh, run here over two miles in length between the towns of Mount Union and Mapleton. Jack's Mountain itself soars to about 2,300 feet and creates a narrow gorge that funnels the Juniata River, the canal, and the middle division, um, and of course, later U.S. Highway Route 22. The name of the mountain and narrows took their name from Captain Jack Armstrong, who was allegedly a, a raided by Indians uh, somewhere around uh, between 1730 and 1744. Jack was a, uh, Armstrong was a trader uh, who traversed this area frequently um, and unfortunately met his demise here. Uh, lost during the Pennsylvania Railroad improvements around the turn of the century is much of the canal bed, uh, which is filled in to expand the right of way. Here, uh, this is a photograph by Gudi Kunst uh, in 1875 of lift lock 32 and Jack's Narrows, and this is looking east. Immediately behind uh, lock 32, uh, not far from, from the last location, the canal takes a 90 degree turn across the Juniata at the Jackstown Aqueduct uh, towards the west end of the Narrows. Finally, this, this last view of the Narrows reveals a very different landscape with the improved and expanded right of way. You can see the fresh cutting on the right hand side as well as MU Tower, which was later known as Jack's in the heart of the Narrows. And to the west behind us, the valley opens up, providing enough land for the village of Mapleton. Uh, scars high in the distant mountain reflect the quarrying of ganister rock, which was common throughout the region. And ganister was used for the production of refractory brick, which was very common in both Mapleton and also Mount Union. This is an early view of the Mapleton station showing the two track right away, right away and the depot uh, framed within the steep elevation of Jack's Mountain in the distance. Leaving the Narrows behind the Juniata Valley again opens up to a widening uh, landscape and offers uh, these beautiful expanded views along the river. Uh, and providing some rich agricultural space along the valley floor. This elevated view at Mill Creek illustrates the grade separation of the Pennsylvania Railroad right away and the widening of the valley. And this also marks the point where Schlater would have had his railroad come from up the Kiskokwalis Creek to the left and join uh, where the existing Pennsylvania Railroad right away is today. CH Tower at Ardenheim uh, in the tangent track uh, just west of, I'm sorry, just east of Huntington, Pennsylvania with Jack's, Jack's Mountain in the background. Uh, details of two Goody Kun stereo views providing opposing views of the canal and right away along the Juniata as the railroad approaches just outside of Huntington, Pennsylvania. This area was known as hieroglyphic rock, appeared, which appeared to be a popular place where locals would inscribe their names on the rocks, as you can kind of make out on the left-hand side. This is an 1875 view of the original alignment uh, coming into Huntington, Pennsylvania, uh, right at the mouth of Standing Stone Creek. The canal area to the left would ultimately be filled in, and the right-of-way swung to the south to eliminate street running down Allegheny Street. At Petersburg, the railroad initially followed the canal along the Frankstown branch of the Juniata to Hollidaysburg, connecting with the Allegheny Portage Railroad. Uh, but in 1854, uh, the construction of the uh, line via, Peters, uh, via Tyrone to Altoona was completed along the Little Juniata. This particular piece of railroad was probably one of the most challenging stretches of railroad to engineer and um, faced quite a few barriers, including uh, its first Tussie Mountain, uh, which required the railroad to tunnel 
through the mountain because of a severe oxbow in the river and no other place to go. The board was completed in 1848, was later reinforced, enlarged, and supplemented uh, throughout the uh, improvements era, and today still survives, but is not in use anymore. The narrowing valley uh, of the Little Junietta River is, uh, uh, as I said, a particularly challenging area. Uh, in 10 miles along this stretch of railroad, uh, it, it required the railroad to cross the river 12 times. Um, for obvious reasons, when the Pennsylvania Railroad expanded to the four-track main line, the best they ever did here was build three tracks. It was just deemed too cost prohibitive to do otherwise. Ah, darn it. Uh, we're going to have to let this one go. Um, one, of ex uh, one of the successors of the bridge that we didn't see previously, which unfortunately was a beautiful little iron bridge, um, was replaced uh, during the Brown era with these you know, textbook stone bridges. Uh, William Brown became known as the stone man for his choice of material uh, from roughly 1887 to roughly 1910. Uh, these bridges were his preferred style for fixed bridges uh, on, on rivers, you know, as wide as the Susquehanna to as narrow as a single lane road. The use of the figure in the foreground, one of one of Rao's sort of hallmarks, he would often put a figure in the foreground for a sense of scale. So he'd probably have one of his assistants or somebody that was on the train with them working um, pose in the foreground to to juxtapose the, the scale of humans against these massive engineering projects and in the landscape. Jumping ahead to Birmingham, we get an idea of the challenges that the Little Junie had opposed to the railroad. Um, the Winding River was bridged again immediately to the west in Birmingham. I'm sorry, to the west of Bur Birmingham. Um, this particular photograph is interesting because the, the fresh debris in the foreground is likely a result of this project just being, excuse me, wrapped up. And you see that in a lot of Rouse photographs where they're tucking things away in the corner of photographs like ladders and stuff like that to be able to, um, you know, clean up the site. Uh, Bir Birmingham itself uh, was a, and, and the general area around it along the Juniata was rich with iron ore deposits. Uh, Birmingham uh, was ideal for quarrying and forging, uh, forging taking place in Tyrone Forge which is uh, a small area where bridge number 12 crossed the Little Juniata, uh, the 12th bridge in, in the succession from just uh, west of Spruce Creek. Um, so the this particular bridge I've always found interesting um, in an era where most of the bridges were, were deck style uh, iron truss bridges. This particular bridge was uh, constructed of iron boiler plate and it was a deck truss. Um, most likely, that's, that iron was probably produced at the Tyrone Forge, um, which is visible there on the right-hand side. Entering the flats where Bald Eagle Creek and the Little Juniata converge, Tyrone is situated at the head of Bald Eagle and Brush Mountains. Uh, you can note the gap in the center where the main line enters Tyrone and arcs to the right along the base of Brush Mountain. And once finally leaving the Little Juniata for the open valley along the foothills of the Alleghenies, the four-track Broadway is readily ev evident in this 1891 view of DI interlocking in Bellwood. Finally, uh, arriving in Altoona, we see Rao's photographic train resting under the shed at the Altoona station and adjacent to the Logan House. Uh, even by this time in 1891, the train shed was beginning to look a little too small uh, for the growing equipment um, and, and the railroad that was about to earn its name as the standard railroad of the world. So this period of 40 years and the imagery that comes from it conveys so much information 
Um, for me, they provide the context of what was, uh, you know, what what existed uh, to understand the significant change that followed, you know, after this in the twentieth and uh, in the in the twentieth and twenty first early twenty first centuries. Um, historically, imagery like this, while its intent was very different at its inception. It brings new value to the landscape from a contemporary context. Um, so for me, I draw a lot of inspiration from this material uh, when I create my own works. Uh, I base it on the historical imagery. I base it on the information and the photographs. I base it on, you know, both formally um, the way the pho photographers put images together and their reference to landscape painting. Um, but I never uh, wanted to make this about recreating their photographs. Uh, it wasn't about being a rephotographic project. So uh, we'll go into some of my work. Um, and I wanted to sort of interject a little bit of history, but also uh, my process and, and how and why I put these photographs together. Uh, this is, again, the 1902 Rockville Bridge, seen uh, upstream from Hecton Mills uh, with Blue Mountain in the distance on the right. Uh, in this particular case, the, the, the stillness of the river um, and the, the quality of light is very reminis reminiscent of Hudson School painters. Um, and, you know, the use of the shoreline up the left-hand side and the way it arcs around helps sort of lead the viewer through the photograph. Uh, this particular image using a high vantage point sort of uh, emphasizes the dramatic uh, landscape uh, around the Dolphin Narrows, where the Susquehanna literally cuts its way through the mountain. To the left is Cove Mountain, to the right is Second Mountain. Um, but in reality, that gap in between there was carved over millions of years by the Susquehanna River. Um, and this particular area is just north of, well, I guess just above Marysville, Pennsylvania. On the water, uh, this low angle juxtaposes the bridge at Sherman's Creek with Peters Mountain in view. Um, Sherman's Creek empties out into the Susquehanna just below the confluence of the Junietta and Susquehanna rivers on the southern edge of Duncannon. This is sort of more of an informational view uh, looking down Cumberland Street, and it shows the sort of context of the Pennsylvania Railroad Depot within the rest of the town. So one of the things I try to do is not just look at the railroad, but also look at the towns and look at the environs and give context to a viewer to kind of evoke a sense of space and a sense of how uh, things relate to one another in the landscape. And then, of course, you have, you know, these big sweeping landscapes like at Clark's Ferry, which is, again, reminiscent of Hudson School paintings um, that really show the expansive valley right at the, the, the head of the confluence of the Susquehanna River to the left and the Juniata River to the far right. Uh, if you look carefully in the back on the right hand side, you can barely make out uh, the bridge at Sherman's Creek uh, that we just looked at a couple couple minutes ago. And like Rao, I like to try to use historical relics to help tell the story of the landscape. Uh, the same abandoned furnace that Rao photographed, the Caroline Furnace, is seen here in Bailey's uh, being passed by the eastbound Pennsylvanian. Um, much of this landscape was completely altered uh, as this furnace was actually just adjacent to the canal. But because the canal was filled in and the railroad expanded, um, there is no more, the, the landscape is completely different from Rao's photograph. Uh, on the railroad, on the railroad's west end of town in Newport uh, at the mouth of Buffalo Creek, I use a low ca camera angle to emphasize the scale of two eras of stone bridges. So in Newport, it's one of the many towns where the original main line was retained to serve industry and in town. Um, so at the left, you have the original stone arch bridge. It was probably built in the late 1880s. 
Um, and then one of the later stone arch bridges on the right when they four tracked the main line and filled into the canal. You can see there's a significant difference in just the size of the stone, let alone the size of the arches, the height. And if you ever wander around in that area and go under the smaller bridge, you can actually see there's a seam um, down the middle of the bridge where one half is brick lined arches and the other half is stone arch, uh, stone lined arch, uh, which indicates some sort of change or expansion to that span at some point. Uh, in, in this landscape scene, sort of reminiscent of William Rao, it's, you know, your typical view of the expansive right away uh, that shows the refinements made in late, teen, in late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, you know, one of the things for me is, is how do you photograph the Pennsylvania Railroad when the Pennsylvania Railroad has been gone 40 or 50 years? And to me, it's images like this and the expansive right away um and just its physical mark on the landscape that that really sort of drives home that idea um so you can lose signals you can lose railroad equipment you can lose tracks but the imprint on the landscape is still there uh this is a dramatic elevated view uh the your use of perspective lines sort of draws the viewer uh right into shade mountain in the distance at Mifflin Interlocking. Uh, historical sites and references to the railroad's predecessors to me are critical in telling the story. So deep in the Lewistown Narrows, uh, where we saw the photograph by Goody Kunst, uh, opposite of the, the track tanks at Hallstone, uh, we see the lock tender's house at lock 13 in Macedonia. Both still preserved and the house has been restored. And then right across the river, um, the still water and dramatic reflections make a compelling composition of early stone walls constructed by the Pennsylvania Railroad within the vicinity of Hallstone. So these bridges, these, these stone walls probably date from the late 1840s, early 1850s. And shrouded behind those trees up on the hillside is actually the hall, the remains of the Hallstone water station. So that that track tank that we saw photographs of from Gutekunst was later expanded and improved upon with a walled cistern and gatehouse that fed the track pans below the uh, below on the right of way. Uh, I found it amazing that this area is virtually untouched. Uh, it's very easy to get to right off of. I don't know if that's 333 or 103 or a combine of the two. Um, but, you know, this engineering facility, this water facility that fed thousands of gallons, millions of gallons of water to thousands of steam locomotives still survives in the woods. And uh, what you're seeing on the left is actually the, the stone walls of the water cistern. And on the right is the gatehouse that would... Um, channel the water down below to the uh, to the track tanks. Most of these gatehouses, there's about, there's probably maybe a dozen of these surviving um, in both Chester, Lancaster County and, and also West. Uh, and many of them had a slate conical roof um, uh, in when they're, when they were originally constructed. I think there's only one or two that still have the roofs that survive. So anyway, uh, looking towards the end of the western uh, uh, end of the Lewistown Narrows, uh, I found this composition um, pretty compelling. Just the the quality of light, um, the bareness of the trees, and the the play of light across the foreground just helps kind of emphasize the scale of uh, Shade Mountain in the background and the and the tangent of track across the the foreground. Uh, Lewistown Junction is a is a great um, it's a great sort of study in the deindustrialization of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, you have this sort of layering of the railroad, the landscape, uh, the mountain ridge across the back, the structures and surviving infrastructure of American Visco. 
which produced uh, synthetic fabric and rayon, among other things. Um, and, you know, it, it, the image itself can tell a story. This could be any town in Pennsylvania in a back lot. Um, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to do was be able to allow the image to convey the sense of this is the state. This is, this is where this, this town is, is now. And, you know, we can see its relationship with the railroad. A little more abstract, um, the juxtaposition of the Mifflin and Center County Railroad Bridge that comes off the main line in the area of Lewistown Station. Um, you know, it's it's sort of emphasized by the shallow and wide section of the Juniata River and framed in by the shadow of the Route 103 bridge. I don't normally work in series like this, um, but this particular view of the, uh, the, the loops, the Granville loops as they're known, illustrates the challenge that the Pennsylvania Railroad had in building the middle division. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a series of valuation maps uh, that, that they did that include, included uh, improvements that the Pennsylvania Railroad wanted to do in this region and ultimately, some of it got done, some of it did not, but they had a plan basically to straighten the Juniata River for about 20 miles to eliminate the need to construct bridges. Um, obviously, uh, finances prevailed. They did what they could. Um, and today we have a couple of bridges versus you know the, the, the series of bridges that they used uh, between Lewistown and uh, Newton Hamilton. So uh, in, in, in these areas, what I always find amazing is that right in front of you, uh, there's elements that survive right underneath the right of way. Uh, so the skewed arch bridge of the maze bridge, which was one of the later uh, improvement bridges uh, frames one of the piers of the 1860s era iron bridge piers um and there's a couple there's there's two or three bridges out there that that have them right in the shadow some are also sort of buried further away from the from the current right away uh this wide dramatic view emphasizes a stretch of tangent track near longfellows uh shortly thereafter the railroad arcs to the right at the base of blue mountain visible in the distance And this is that uh, 1850s boarding house that survives in McVeigh Town, uh, juxtaposed right against the railroad. There's a there's a small stone, date stone right in the left hand corner, uh, just just below that that first story window uh, that that denotes that it was constructed in 1850, which is literally just after the railroad arrived in town. So, you know, not all of this is about the current. Uh, it's also about considering the relics that remain. And at Vineyard, uh, this is the remains of one of the original alignments that were eliminated in straightening the right of way and, and altering the, the course of the river. Uh, again, these particular piers uh, would, would have carried a, a, a box truss, uh, like deck truss iron bridge that that went across both the canal bed and the Juniata River. Um, and also uh, in in various places, you can find remnants of the canal prism um, in this particular area uh, between McVeigh Town and Mount Union. There's there's quite a few locations where you can come across these beautiful scenes. And, uh, you know, the for me, it's the quality of light, the the reflection, and that sort of vanishing point in the landscape that just gets swallowed up by the trees that helps you think about, you know, this this past sort of uh, mode of transportation that was replaced by the railroad. Uh, this is the um, bridge one forty seven. Uh, there's there's been a I'm sorry, not one forty seven, one twenty four. No, yeah, one forty seven. Sorry. I've different name in my notes here um so this was one of the later stone bridges constructed on the middle division it was completed in 1906 
And interestingly enough, on the bridge plaque for this, it shows the changing of the guard from Chief Engineer William H. Brown to his successor, William C. Shand, who not long after this would abandon the use of stone and migrate towards the more modern uh, process of using reinforced concrete for constructing bridges, overpasses, and retaining walls. Um, this particular path uh, is where that aqueduct, Schaefer's Aqueduct, stood. Um, and immediately behind it is where the original uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge uh, existed. Uh, this image I used a, a combination of compression and 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 uh, emphasizing the kind of chaos of the foreground to tell a story. Uh, like Newport, Mount Union, uh, or the original main line dissected the center of town. Um, it was also the point of interchange between the Pennsylvania Railroad and the East Broadtop Railroad. Um, so in the late 1900s, early 20, uh, early 20th century, I'm sorry, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, grade separations in towns like this removed the importance of the main line. Um, but in cases where it was needed, they would re retain it in this case, to interchange with the East Broadtop Railroad. Uh, this is number three curve looking east into Jack's Narrows. Uh, you know, the, the Narrows are probably one of the, the places that are like a holy grail uh, on the Pennsylvania Railroad. If you look at the historical imagery, there were three places that the railroad always had photographed or depicted the the, the uh, Lewistown Narrows, Jack's Narrows, and Pack Saddle Narrows. Um, in this particular image, the the the, the dramatic quality of light uh, that's that's shining on the face of Jack's Mountain in the distance emphasizes the sense of scale. Uh, I I purposely included sort of a low view of the access road to reference what was there. Um, you know, and, and, and that means two things, right? There was two other mainline tracks there, but before that, there was a canal under there. So the layers of history are all kind of summed up in the photograph. And then on the opposite side, um, in, uh, in this elevated view, we get to see how this rugged valleys opens up. Um, this is accessed by the thousand steps trail. Uh, this Popular hiking trail was once the uh, trail that quarrymen built to get to their job site high above on Jack's Mountain, uh, where they where they mined ganister rock. Uh, it was quarried and carted down the side of the mountain and processed uh, for silica brick in Mount Union. I couldn't imagine making that commute every day. And it's not a thousand steps. It's more like 1,200. <clears throat> Um, one of the many archaeological parts of the project, you know, really, it, it includes discovering relics, relics in place. And this is actually the remaining stone piers of the former Jackstown aque aqueduct uh, from the main line of Public Works Canal, um, which has stood in that river for over 200 years or almost 200 years. Uh, west of the Narrows, the village of Mapleton stands in the shadow of Jack's Mountain. Uh, this old house really reminds me of something out of an Edward Hopper or Charles Birchfield painting, probably witnessing over 100 years of operation along the railroad. Uh, in a nod to William Rowe, we see the face of Sidling Hill and Terrace Mountain to the left, possibly Stone Ridge in the distance, signifying the approach to Huntington. Uh, it's images like this that, you know, I, I, I love the dramatic views of, of this stunning landscape. So if I have an opportunity, you know, not every picture has to have the railroad in it. Uh, a longer lens sort of compresses space and emphasizes another case of improvements evident uh, in the 1875 view of Huntington, Pennsylvania. So the original alignment that ran down Allegheny Street was on this bridge in the foreground. The bridge in the foreground was likely replaced in the early to mid 1880s. 
And then the uh, more modern bridge was replaced uh, over a series of improvements uh, in the background. And you can see that it's faced with concrete as they've had uh, constant problems there with, with subsiding stone on the, on the side of the bridge. <clears throat> uh, the surfaces and materials of the, of this brick station dating from 1872 are highlighted by a nice strong side light. Uh, the, the Huntington station uh, served the Pennsylvania railroad fairly, fairly early on, originally on the opposite side along Allegheny street where the tracks ran through town. And then later um, on this side, starting in 1891, and then further work be, uh, continued in 1894, which filled in the canal. So if you ever visit Huntington, you notice that this structure is pretty far back from the right of way. And that was as a result of them not moving the station from the current or from its existing to the current right of way. So, you know, the station is actually further away um, because of its position being built along the original right of way down Allegheny Street. Uh, snow and overcast skies create a really nice graphic view of the remnants of the Petersburg branch crossing the Little Juniata near Alexandria. Uh, this branch was the original route to uh, over the Allegheny Mountains before the Pennsylvania Railroad completed the mountain division um, and has seen various uh, restorations of, of life or uh, depending on traffic in particular during World War II. So this this line kind of served as a as a relief valve, if you will, for the for the Pensy's bottleneck of three tracks through the area of Spruce Creek. Uh, this uh, view looking west towards Tussie Mountain uh, emphasizes the Barry Strait, which is a tangent section of track that blazes right towards one of the most complicated pieces of the division. The masonry and foliage are highlighted by soft light in this view looking east from the mouth of Tussie Mountains Tunnel, uh, also known as Spruce Creek Tunnel. As I said before, this was completed in 1849. Uh, it was later expanded, received the masonry portal, and eventually be supplemented with a new alignment and tunnel to the north, complicated or completed in 1889. Uh, during Conrail's improvement projects, uh, in the 1990s, the original bore uh, was used briefly and then retired after the new tunnel was expanded. Uh, this particular tunnel has had a bad history of collapses. And uh, in addition to several when the Pennsylvania Railroad was still using it, um, now the entire center of the tunnel has collapsed and is not passable. Lots of snakes like to be in there, by the way. I wouldn't recommend going in there. Uh, while one of the more dramatic parts of the, of the middle division um, is this stretch between Spruce Creek and Tyrone, uh, contemporarily, it's one of the most difficult places to photograph because uh, there's it's very remote. Uh, there's a lot of trees. And, you know, w the only way to really get at it is to hike it. Um, fortunately, because of the removal of the third track, there's a substantial... Uh, area shoulder along the railroad um, that allows you to get into areas um, that are safe and that you're not you're not putting yourself in danger um, but this is you know this is an area that i really wanted to illustrate because it just required so much work um, to to get the railroad through this area and this particular location is known as bridge number one this was the first bridge west of um Spruce Creek Tunnel. Unfortunately, one of the images previous that didn't load, uh, bridge number three, uh, this is the original stone pier from the Iron Bridge that we didn't get to see. Uh, this actually survives upstream um, from the current bridge three uh, in the woods. It was a remarkable little find. A uh, friend of mine that knows the railroad like the back of his hand out here uh, turned me on to the area and there it was this beautiful little small cut stone uh, abutment that carried the, the bridge across the river. Wouldn't recommend trying to go back there in the summertime. Um, 
Highlighted by a fresh layer of snow, bridge number six spans the little Juniata near Jensen Moore Run. Um, even Brown's bridges of stone needed care over the years, uh, and you often see that with the use of concrete reinforcement and steel bars, which is evident on the face of this bridge. Um, you know, what throughout this segment of the railroad, the, the river and, and the railroad execute a, a really beautifully choreographed dance as the railroad attempts to push a straight line across this river. Uh, this particular image reminds me of how somebody would experience this by train. Um, it illustrates the sort of splintered path of the river uh, as it approaches Birmingham, uh, which is basically just kind of a ghost town now along the Little Juniata. We mentioned um, iron ore. Uh, at Plummer Hollow, the Lewisburg and Tyrone br branch split from the main line um, into Center County to serve the Pennsylvania Furnace and later tap Carnegie's uh, iron ore deposits via, via branch constructed to Scotia, Pennsylvania. This was known as the Fairbrook branch the L and the T had an interesting history, but it, it never really sort of materialized. Um, one of the really amazing things about this dead end span is that before the Fairmount branch, this bridge actually carried the main line across the Connemaw River in the city of Johnstown, where it was then replaced by the stone bridge that's so famous in the 1889 flood. So the Pennsylvania Railroad disassembled this bridge took it about 90 miles east and reassembled it on this branch to reuse it. And because of that, it still, it still survives today. Again, not always including the railroad. So, you know, a little bit of, a, of, of the overhead uh, bridge sort of indicates that, you know, we're, we're framed in by the railroad, but we're looking at the back streets of town I think one of the things that I've always enjoyed about riding the railroad and, and the way I look at the landscape is you get to see a part of the American landscape that most people don't see. It's a, it's a closer connection and a more authentic connection to how the landscape developed versus being on the interstate where you just kind of skirt everything and it's very sterile. Um, so, you know, it's, it's views like this that again, like that image, along the Juniata gives you this perspective of, of not just experience in the railroad, but traveling the railroad. <clears throat> the Altoona Terminal, of course, is a subject worthy of volumes. Um, much of it has changed or is gone or it's been reduced uh, in importance. Uh, this particular location was the apex of the hump for westbound empty uh, cars. Uh, WJ uh, was the name of the tower, um, and it sat uh, at the apex of a stone tunnel over the main line uh, with a with a castle-like structure that was the, the tower. Uh, during the Conrail Improvements era, the bridge was replaced, uh, but the bridge is essentially a bridge to nowhere. Much of the rail yard and the hump yard is, is long out of service and completely treed in. Uh, opposite and further west is the Juniata Scales, located at the apex of the eastbound classification yard. Uh, this facility dates from 1827 and stands dormant. Part of the structure to the right is uh, part of the uh, maintenance of way uh, shop. Uh, but I really like the, the quality of light here sort of gives it this sense of isolation, which is fitting for this kind of relic that's just sitting outside the yard or, or sort of isolated in an inactive part of the yard. Uh, this particular image, the, the dramatic light really highlights the, the leading lines of the trackage and, and the sort of industrial nod uh, of the Seventh Street Bridge, sort of acknowledging the fact that Altoona has this beautiful industrial history uh, and, and its presence of the Pennsylvania Railroad. You know, you can see the Altoona or the Juniata works rather uh, framed in on the right hand side, as well as the main line sort of pushing through the entire terminal complex. 
And of course, finally, in a view looking towards the horizon, uh, we close with the contemporary images of the structure that has stood sentinel along the main line and denotes the end of the middle division. JK, or later known as Alto Tower, stands guard as the right-of-way narrows from three to two tracks leaving town um, to wind its way up Burgoon Run and over the Horseshoe Curve. So why is all this work important? Um, both the historic and contemporary allows us to relate and connect to places uh, through imagery and through memory. And with ever changing, with the ever changing nature of, of humans, unfortunately, uh, we're eliminating and destroying and altering things of the past. It's a reality of our culture, and unfortunately, preservation can only save so much. So, for me, understanding how to read these photographs and draw inspiration from them, and then go out and read the landscape, that's where photography comes into play for me. Um, my efforts to preserve these scenes and have them reside in institutions where they can be utilized to un understand the continual change of the landscape is really what motivates me. And, you know, I, I continue to do this um, as part of the longstanding tradition of some of these photographers that were hired by the railroads in the 18 and 1900s um, to, you know, perpetuate that sense of importance um, for future generations to come. So I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. And, um, you know, if, if you have any questions or any feedback, I'm all ears. Thank you. Uh, that is, uh, that is Woodvale Yard in, uh, on the, on the Eastern end of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Yes. Yep. There's quite a few of them in Johnstown. Every every neighborhood has one. Mike, yes. What did uh, Mr. Rao use as a camera? So Rao's uh, for the for the Pennsylvania Railroad Commissions, most of them were an 18 by 22 inch view camera. It's a big camera. Yeah, and they're all glass plates, dry plates. They were pre coated in a factory. Um, and Raoul, as well as Goody Kunst, and I'm not sure, I, I'm thinking Perviance did too. Um, they were appointed a special car so they could process the stuff after exposure and store it. Nice. They're beautiful. And if you ever have the chance to see them in person, um, the Library Company of Philadelphia has a good bit of them on deposit there. They don't own them, but they're available. Yeah. Any Anything else? Yeah. Sure. So is, do you have a process for finding the perfect weather? <laughs> um, I, honestly, what I get is what I get. You know, I, I, I prefer uh, to go out in adverse conditions over sunny conditions. Um, but, you know, when you can take time off, you make it work. And it's funny because when when I was doing this work without the assistance of the railroads, I I could choose that. But when I started doing work with Amtrak um, further east, um, you know, we were coordinating watchmen and crews and time and all that stuff. So, again, you know, you just have to adapt and know how to manipulate the materials and the exposure to get what you need to get out of it. But, yep. Yeah. The uh, volunteers at the Lewistown station claim that their station is the oldest surviving. Yeah, That's yeah. Correct. Yeah, I, I believe so. It was built in 1849. So, yeah, that's, I think Overbrook's a close second. Um, yeah, I, I believe Overbrook's like maybe, is it 51? John, do you know? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I think, yeah, I think there's a historical marker there too. Um, but, you know, we're lucky to have both. I mean, they're two completely different structures. One's brick, one's wood frame. Um, you know, they're and and from different eras and different needs. So the Lewistown station is it is it in Lewistown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's in Lewistown Junction, okay. right? So the city of Lewistown is on the other side of the river. 
And that whole area by the terminal was kind of isolated. And that's another thing that I always found interesting about looking at these towns. Mifflin's the same way, right? Mifflin town is on the other side of the river. The expansion of the town to get to the railroad is where Mifflin is. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a sort of later subsect of, of that area. So you, you see that kind of pattern in different towns throughout the area. Did you uh, take any pictures of the Juniata Valley? Short line or uh, I haven't I haven't wandered out the 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 secondary much. Um I do I want to get back to those shops before that turntable's lost. Um but uh but no I have not I, I need to connect with them. They were there was talk about them getting rid of that, okay. but you know, who knows? You know, that probably cost money. So um yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so the biggest reason why I don't use color is because it's, it's too contemporary, you know, in, in, in these images, um, color brings a completely different reality to the photographs, the black and white strips, any sense of whether this is contemporary or not. And that's important to me. Um, I do color work. I mean, you know, I, I, I and, and since the last 10 years when I've been shooting more digital and less film, you know, you have the luxury of looking at it in color and there's been some where I'm like, oh, no, that looks kind of nice, but this is a project that's been going since 2007. So I'm not changing now. <laughs> Most of these digital? Uh, no, uh, I'd say 50, 50 from what uh, of, of my work that you've seen uh, 50, 50. Uh, around 2000, maybe 15, I started using 16. I started using digital. Uh, before that, it was a five by seven view camera. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I used Ilford for a while and then I had some technical issues, some, some like coding flaws and I stopped using Ilford and went to Kodak, uh, Tri-X. Uh, unfortunately, Tri-X is not a very nice film. So it wasn't a, a lot of love loss when I moved to digital, not to mention being able to, you know, go back to the hotel and immediately get feedback on your imagery is huge. Um, it's, it's really helpful for me because when I had, when I was using film, I wouldn't see the images for sometimes six months. If I came back with 150 sheets of film to process, processing them four sheets at a time, that took some time. So not to mention the cost. Six dollars a picture with film, so yeah. Yes. Right now, I'm using a Canon R5, um, and I have a Canon 5DS as my backup. Um, you know, the 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 digital cameras now are incredible because you know I have I have one tool in my bag that can do everything. It can shoot video. It can it can, you know, do quick photojournalism style stuff. I can do architectural work with it. Um, it's it's incredible to have that ability. Um, but I do still use film occasionally. Um, I do a lot of Habs hair documentation work and all that has to be on film. And, you know, there's fewer and fewer of us that are able and willing to do it. So everything, everything. Yep. Yeah. Um, the The only, I think the only image in there that was handheld was the one from uh, the Thousand Steps Trail because I wasn't about to drag anything extra up that hill. 